Hello, Faith family. Great to see you again. Enjoy our time in the Word through our Sunday School lesson. And whether you're coming into this Word in the morning or perhaps the afternoon is a better time for you to come to your lesson, I think you're going to see God has once again proven to be perfect in His timing. Because we're starting into a new seven-week focus called Living with Hope. Now, I'll tell you what, we need to hear that message now probably more than ever before. We've always needed hope, but I think now more than ever, we need more hope because we're seeing so much unrest. We're seeing so much hate and violence and anger being unleashed. And the fact is, if you trace it back to me, one of the reasons why we're seeing this is because people are so disappointed. The places that they've put their hope, whether that's financial institutions or individuals, uh, all these things that have failed them and now they're left with the emptiness and the frustration. And I truly believe they're again, that once again, they're looking for hope, not just answers. They're looking for hope. And so how appropriate is it that in this season of so much unrest that we're coming to a seven week focus on living with hope. In fact, today we're, we're, we're kind of honing in on what is the basis of hope because let's face it, you can have hope, but where you direct that hope, what the, what's the foundation of that hope is key to where it will actually sustain and satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. Now, our editor for this particular lesson or for this particular study, uh, his name is Jeff Belcher. Jeff makes a, state, a couple of statements that I wanted to, to give to you. They come from the student edition. So just a reminder, as I give quotes or as I make references that I'm using the student edition. So adults, I hope I'm not getting you confused with that, but obviously we'll focus on the text in a moment. But the editor, Jeff Belcher, says this. In the Bible, hope is mentioned over 150 times. And so if we consider the fact that there are 66 books, you know, 39 old, 27 new, and the hope is mentioned over 150 times, then that's an average of at least two times in each book. So that's a pretty good average when you consider it. And so he also says this in terms of how do we understand hope? Well, what do we mean by hope? And of course, this is something of his own opinion, but I have to feel like it's found, it's formed from scripture. And he says this, Hope is the confident expectation that no matter how challenging life may be, God has it all under control and he will faithfully deliver on all that he's promised. Wow. That does bring assurance, doesn't it? That really is the source of hope that God will fulfill all that he's promised, that God does have it all under control. Man, in a time when it seems like everything is out of control on many different levels, what a great assurance, what a tremendous source of hope that God has it all under control and that he will fulfill all that he's promised. Praise God. And so this morning we're focusing on 1 Peter chapter 1. And fascinating that the writer, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm talking about our student edition, but I think it's true across the board, that our writer in this case is Dr. Michael Catt. And that name doesn't sound familiar. He's pastor of Sherwood Baptist Church in uh, Albany, Georgia. Now, hopefully that is familiar because out of Sherwood come the Kendrick brothers. Uh, Courageous, Facing the Giants, Overcomer, all these different movies came out of that set, that setting, that situation. And of course, you have to know his teaching was a, a big part in laying the foundation for that. And in every one of those movies, you have the position where there, there's un, there's anxiety, there's uncertainty, uh, everything's breaking down around them, and then suddenly, hope. Out of that comes hope. And so one of the things that uh, Dr. Cat asks is, how can you remain anchored to Christ as your hope? And that's what we're looking at today. Today's lesson is titled, Living Hope. How can we remain anchored to Christ? What is the basis for our hope? And so I want you to take your Bible if you haven't already, or if you've got your study edition, your student book, that'll be fine too because the text is listed for you there. Of course, we'll be in the CSB from the translation we use. Um, but if you don't have your Bible, grab it now or grab your electronic device you use it. And let's read through these verses. Uh, these are rich verses. There's a lot there to unpack. But we're going to read through them, and then we're going to divide up into three sections and begin to break it down with some key questions. So 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll of course start with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 
chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which is though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. Because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So I want to start with one of the questions that our writer puts before us in the sec- the first section. And the first section is verses 1 through 3. And the question is this. In your own words, how would you describe hope? Think about that for a moment. And if you need to pause, pause it. And just, just really think about that. Maybe even take a piece of paper and write out your thought. But in your own words... How would you describe hope? Another question that I would put to you is, is how important is hope? How important is hope? And the reason why I'm asking that is, is in the student edition, he presents an illustration, and I think it's a great one, around, and it centers on the life of Florence Chadwick. Florence Chadwick, back in the mid-1950s uh, or so, about, was a, a champion long-distance swimmer. Uh, one of the greatest in the world, if not the greatest in the world, in the women's division. In fact, she one time in 1950 swam the English Channel from Great Britain over to France, 21 miles. She swam 21 miles, and she did it faster than any woman in history. Well, in 1956, she just tried to, 1952, excuse me, she decided to try to accomplish another gigantic feat and swim the 26 mile distance between the Catalina Island and the mainland of California. Well, the day came, she set out swimming, and she swam. Of course, she had to go through all sorts of different adverse uh, things. One of them was an oil leak. Another one was the, the nausea that came from that. And, of course, just the, the overall fatigue of trying to swim that far. And, and I, don't know if, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pacific Ocean, but it's a little more violent than what we're used to seeing. And I've seen it, I can tell you for sure. And so she faced all those obstacles, but the one obstacle that wound up getting her was that as she approached the mainland, the temperatures began to rise and a dense fog set in, so much so that she couldn't see land anymore. She she lost reference point. And when she did that, she felt like, I mean, because she didn't have any reference point to kind of base direction, she felt like she was swimming in a circle because in her mind, she should be close to land. She should be sensing land. She should be hearing the, the sounds of waves crashing on land. All that should be coming in to her, her perspective. And, and she couldn't do that. And so eventually she grew tired. And again, thinking that all she's doing is swimming in circles, she quit. She gave up. Well, her rescuers came. She called out to the rescuers. They came, took her out of the water. And much to her dismay, she discovered that she was only about a half a mile from land. She had, she had swam 25 and a half miles. But that just goes to show you, friends, when we don't have our hope fixed on a firm point, not based on a firm foundation, then we're always going to come up short. We're always going to be disappointed. We're always going to lack something. And so Peter starts out this letter to the believers. It's an encouragement letter. It's, it's a challenge letter. But he starts it out with the foundation, laying the foundation. Verse 1. An apostle of Jesus Christ to those chosen, living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to God. So here we go. He's saying, hey, your condition is you're an exile. Now, because he lists all these different regions, and this is a broad, these are broad regions, by the way. Because he lists all these regions, our tendency might be to say, be, well, he's talking about the fact that they've been pushed out of their home country through the diaspora, through the persecution into these other different regions, and, and they're discouraged about that, so he's trying to encourage them in that. But that's missing the point. The point that Peter is making is, is that whether you're in Pontus, whether you're in Cappadocia, Bithynia, Asia, Galatia, wherever you are, 
you're an exile. The, the word that we might better associate with is you're a sojourner. You're a pilgrim. That you are here right now on this planet, on earth, in this region, and you feel like a pilgrim. You, you know that this is not your home. You know that you're only here for a short season. And in that, you're discouraged. He said, but I want to discourage, I want to encourage you. First of all, he says, those chosen. And he used the same word again at the end of verse one, chosen. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, he says, our hope needs to be fixed in the reality of who we are, not where we are, not the conditions that we face, in who we are. Who we are, he says, are the chosen of God. He has chosen us separate us out of the world. How do we know that? Well, the other phrase, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. We know the word sanctify means to set apart, to pull out from, to to uh, separate for a purpose. And so it's the Holy Spirit that's now working to separate us from the world and to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. So what's that meaning? Well, that's talking about the idea of, of a sealing of a covenant agreement. Because through a covenant agreement, and of course, especially when you have an agreement between God and man, it was often, especially in the Old Testament setting, it would be sealed with the sprinkling of the blood that had been offered for forgiveness. Some of that blood would be reserved. Some of it would be sprinkled on the altar as an offering of, for the sins committed and the covering of God for that. And God uh, acknowledging his, his righteous anger satisfied. But then uh, the rest of that blood would be reserved. And then as the agreement was finalized, the blood would be sprinkled and a symbol of a covenant agreement. And so Peter is saying, hey, you were chosen of God. Now you have the assurance that you're saved because the Holy Spirit is working his, act, his, his ministry of sanctification in you. You have the Holy Spirit working there as an assurance. It's like Paul said in Romans. The Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we're children of God, so we have that assurance in that. He says also, for the purpose of being obedient, so your obedience, the fact that you can obey the will of God, is an affirmation of your standing in God. And then lastly, you've been sprinkled. So the covenant's been sealed. It's been, it's been finalized in Christ. And he says, for that reason, grace and peace can be multiplied to you. It says, may grace and peace, but the whole idea is that grace and peace are indeed being multiplied to you beyond any measure. And then we come to the heart of it, verse 3. Because of his great mercy. And so what we're experiencing is not based on our achievements. It's not based on our ability to continue to meet a standard because we can't do it. We still need God's forgiveness repeatedly. That's the reason why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess, God is faithful. He's able to forgive. So here he says, because of God's great mercy. So it's by God's mercy that we now have this firm, fixed position of hope in Christ. He has given us, here it is, new birth. Wow. Born again. Born again what? Into the living hope. What do you mean living hope? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So see how it's sequential in nature? So because of his mercy, he gave us new life. We've been born again in Christ because of, and because of that, we now have living hope. Meaning that it's a hope that's now very much present and active it's going to be realized in a future experience, whether that's through death and resurrection or whether that's through the return of Christ. And it all hinges on the completed work of Christ through his death and resurrection. And so what's the basis of our hope? And I ask a very pertinent question. And again, I think it relates to the context of what we're experiencing today. And here's where I want you to pause and give some careful thought for yourself and for just an understanding in culture. What do people place their hope in today? And if you're struggling with that one, then watch a sitcom and notice the commercials. Um, scroll through your social feed. Notice the different advertisements that are there, which, scary enough, they're able to link up with your searches and, and things. And so I even hear a while back, I recognized that a conversation I had with someone, I hadn't Google searched it or anything, and a conversation I had with someone, now suddenly... The, the idea or the uh, the subject we talked about in our conversation was coming up in my news feed, coming up in my feed. That scared me terribly. 
Um, that's a conversation for another day. But if you're, if you're wondering what people place their hope in, just go to those two main medias. Those are two main media outlets, social media and then the mainstream media, and just watch the commercials, listen to the sales pitches they make, because they're making them based on the deep desires that they know people have. And then lastly, what do you place your hope in today? So pause that for a moment, reflect back on verse three, especially in terms of where we should place our hope, and then answer the question, what do people place their hope in today? All right, so we spent a little time looking at what we should place our hope in in contrast to what people typically do place their hope in. And I hope you had a challenging time going through that both for yourself and in an examination of what we as a culture typically place our hope in. And so now we're turning our focus to what does that mean to put your hope in Christ? How will that, what does that, how will it affect the future? How does it affect me in the current? And so we turn our attention back to verses four and five where Peter says, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And so Peter, interestingly enough, first puts the focus toward how our hope in Christ affects our future. And the terms he used, of course, are intention. But it's fascinating that he stresses the same idea with three different terms, the idea of incorruptibility. First of all, an inheritance. Their idea of inheritance is, is something of value that is then passed down, whether that's some knowledge, understanding, or, of course, financial gain, property, things like that. And so we think about inheritance, we think about something of value. So he says, and an inheritance, something of value that's being passed down to us, being promised to us to be realized in a future experience. And that thing he said, that inheritance, he says, is three, three aspects of it. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. First of all, the word imperishable. And really, we can generalize all three of these words. I'm going to break them down for you, but all three words can be summarized by the idea of being free from the corruption and being free from the effect of the fall, the curse. And that's, that's really what it means. That's really why he's, he's used all three of these to, to overwhelmingly convey that idea. Imperishable, meaning that it's not subject to the curse, incorruptible. And then undefiled, meaning it doesn't have the to polluting effects of sin, affecting it in any way. And then lastly, unfading. And that's kind of a, a word picture there. It's the image of a flower that doesn't go through that dormant phase. It's, it's always brilliant. It's, it's, it's never uh, dwindled or, or, or withered. It, it always looks beautiful and, and prestigious. And then lastly, it says kept in heaven for you. The word kept there can also be translated guarded or protected. You know, if you think about it this way, if you have a million dollars, which would you rather do? Put it in a piggy bank and set it up on your shelf or go to a legitimate bank where they've got this enormous safe that's behind tons and tons of concrete and steel, a lock, a security guard. That symbolizes in every facet of imagination, protection and guarded. Well, Peter says, hey, God can do even better than that. He's guarding your inheritance himself. He has protected it from pollution. He is protecting it from the corruption of, of sin and the curse. It will be prestigious, beautiful. But it's not just, our hope isn't just for a future inheritance. Notice what he says in verse 5. Hey, he says we're being protected now. We're being guarded right now by faith in God. And so our hope is in Christ now to protect our salvation, to seal our salvation, which as we talked about it in verse 3, that came through that sprinkling, the signifying of a sealing of a covenant, that it's complete, it's finished, it's done. Nothing can affect that. Death is the only way out of that. And so we are now, we now have the hope that our salvation is protected, is guarded, it's sealed in Christ. Meaning that when Satan tries to deceive us and discourage us and convince us that whatever we've done or whatever is in our life that shouldn't be, that is automatically disqualifying us from our salvation. No, it's obviously hindering our fellowship with God and our walk with God, but it is not in any way, it cannot, according to Scripture, take our salvation. Not possible. And then if our physical life is threatened, whether through disease that we've contracted or through uh, the, the uh, persecution of man, doesn't matter. That cannot take our salvation. You want to talk about hope. 
That's hope that does not disappoint. And it's hope that's placed completely and unquestionably in the completed work of Jesus. And so based on those two sealed certain realities, our writer asks us to think about two questions. First, how does Peter's description of our inheritance give us hope right now? Well, I would say one of the ways it does that is because as we watch everything that we had placed our hope in, hope in, rust away or be stolen, you know, it makes me think about Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, do not store up treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But put up tre store up treasure in heaven where neither moth or rust destroy and where the thief cannot break in and steal. So, hey, how does our hope in Christ, hope of an inheritance, provide us with uh, hope in the present? And then the second question is, what is your response to knowing that you're being guarded by God's power? Hopefully your response is assurance, it's peace, and it's, it's that hope that cannot be swayed by the ever-changing, ever-devolving situation in, of context and circumstances. So pause the video for a moment. Think through that in light of verses 4 and 5. Go back and read verses 4 and 5. And look at those terms that Peter uses about the future hope. And then look at that assurance that Peter provides for the present persecution, the present context in terms of our salvation. And then answer those two questions. All right, so let's wrap up today's lesson by focusing on the last few verses, 6, 7, 8, and 9. But before we get into the verses itself, I want to focus on one of the questions that the writer asks, and you'll see why in just a moment. What have you seen, when have you seen suffering translate into greater Christ likeness? And of course, the reason why that question is posed is because in verse 6, Peter says, You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. It's almost like verse 6 could have a therefore pointing us back to 1 through 5. Of course, the, the assurances that we have in Christ, the fact that we're guarded, the fact that we're provided, we have provided an inheritance that's imperishable, uncorruptible, all those truths that are related in a future expectation but provide us hope in a present condition. And that's no, no, no doubt what Peter's talking about here is that the present condition is suffering. But he goes to the point of suffering. And I think that's one of the things about hope. Hope brings a, a, a purpose to suffering. And you say, what do you mean, Brent? Well, Peter says that this whole time of trial is producing proven character of faith, which is more valuable than gold, which is, though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he's going right to the aspect of faith saying that even though for right now in your current circumstance there's there's struggling, there's there's hardship, there's difficulty, there's persecution, all these things are a reality in your life right now. The hope that you have in Christ, that's been sealed in Christ, is producing in you a faith that will not only be sustain you, but is now sanctifying you, is being purified. That's what verse 7 is saying. That faith through this avenue of persecution is being refined just like gold is refined through fire and it's perishable and with us what is being refined what's being produced is praise glory and honor at the revelation of jesus and so peter concludes his encouraging words with this though you haven't seen him you love him though not seeing him now you believe in him and you rejoice with an expressible joy and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. And so there Peter says, hey, your faith as testified to the fact that you haven't even seen him, you you, uh, you believe in him even though you haven't seen him, you place your, your faith, your hope in him, and you rejoice in that, and that in and of itself is producing the salvation of your souls. And that's the very essence of hope. Hope is rooted in salvation that is guaranteed to us through the completed work of Jesus. And sealed in that covenant of blood, like we talked about it earlier, the sprinkling of the blood. So we have assurance, for both for in our current struggles and circumstances and in our eternal expectation, we have hope. And hope will not disappoint. And so let's get into the application side of things now. Now, with the student edition, I especially want you to focus on number nine, which comes under the heading of Christ. 
I like it. I think it's very ultra practical. And the reason why is because the, the writer says, and of course in the student edition, he actually has a chart. And, and so if you don't have the student edition book, don't worry about that. Get a blank piece of paper, divide it into two, two columns. In the left column, and of course students, you're gonna use your book, but in the left column, you're gonna list a word or, or uh, an idea that was brought out, but try to summarize it in the word itself, in the text, and then describe what, how that uh, applies to you, how that brings hope for you. And so one example that the writer gives, he, he lists the word chosen. And he says this, God loved me and chose me as his child. So the reality is I'm chosen. The hope that brings me is that I am a child of God. I'm loved by God. I'm a child of God. So there's one example. Another one that I'll give you is the word exile. Well, what does that mean? It means that I'm a spiritual pilgrim passing through this temporary world to my eternal home. So there again, the word, and then what does that speak to you in terms of the idea of hope? You know, uh, and so I really want you to focus on that. So let me explain one more time. If you've got the student book, just do number, make sure you do number nine under the heading of Christ. If you don't have the student book, take a blank sheet of paper, create two columns, and the column on your left write a word from the text and then on the column on the right side corresponding to that write out what that means to you how that brings hope to you what that sounds like what that looks like and so i, re I really hope you'll you'll be extensive with that you'll work slowly through the text focusing on each one of those words that speaks truth that brings about the hope that we're all learn longing for in Christ. And then underneath community, and again, I'm in a student book, so I'm gonna read it out for those who don't have a student book. It says this, who do you know who may be losing hope? Who do you know who's lost hope, basically, is what they're saying. Well, that takes some time to think about, but once you think about it, once you're sure about that, the challenge basically is to, to really go to that individual, offer to pray with that individual, listen to that individual, speak truth into their life. But don't just let them dangle in that reality. Don't let them just exist in a reality of hopelessness. And I'll tell you what, right now in our country, I guarantee you, you won't have a problem finding someone who doesn't have hope or, be, or better yet, they're losing what hope they had. Help them understand that perhaps their hope wasn't fixed in the right place. Their hope was fixed on circumstances and situations, individuals, careers, uh, family relationships, all of these different things that on their own have a sense of wholesomeness, but then when they become our focus of hope, then they're setting us up for discouragement and disappointment. You can be a voice of reason and you can be a voice of truth in their life today. So I hope this gets us home. How you like that? I hope this lesson launches us into a phenomenal week of understanding that right now, in this circumstance of so much uh, uh, uneasiness, so much unrest, so much turmoil, rioting, so much division and strife and vitriol, in this season where that's the, that's the norm in our country, we as the church can shine and we should shine. And we can do that by providing hope to the hurting, by providing truth to the searching, and providing light to those who are currently walking in darkness. And as always, friends, your pastor loves you. And I want to remind you that every day you wake up, leave home wherever you're going. Remember to do it, living sin.